Good evening. On behalf of the Student Academy of Doctors of Audiology, I would like to welcome you to today's Student Practice Management Webinar, Pricing Strategies in an Audiology Practice. My name is Stephanie Chayeski, and I'm pleased to serve as today's course coordinator. I have just a few housekeeping reminders before we begin. First, if you have any technical challenges during the session, please use the chat feature to make me aware, and I will be glad to assist you. Please type your questions into the question queue, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation. And I want to make sure that everyone knows that today's presentation is being recorded, and we will it will be available for online viewing next week. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce the course moderator for this session, Kate Witham, SATA board president and third year AUD student at Gallaudet University. Kate? Thank you, Stephanie. On behalf of the SATA board, I am excited for the opportunity to welcome AUD students from programs across the country to this session on pricing, pricing at audiology practices. It is also my distinct pleasure to introduce today's course leader, Dr. Amlani. Amin Amlani, PhD, is Director of Professional Development and Education at Audigy. Prior to this position, Dr. Amlani was an academician for nearly two decades, where he pursued scholarly activities primarily in the areas of economics and marketing trends with audiology, particularly with respect to evolving disruptive technologies, um, direct consumer hearing tests and amplifon technologies, consumer purchasing models, provider service delivery models, hearing conservation for musicians, and room acoustics. Dr. Amlani also serves as the editor for the economic section at Hearing Health, hearing health Technology Matters. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Dr. Amlani. Great, thank you so much, Kate. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this wonderful series that the SATA group has, has compiled. It's, uh, it's fantastic and I, I applaud you all for that. Um, as, uh, as you pointed out, I am the Director of uh, Professional Development and Education here at Audigy. And as part of my role is to help practices improve uh, their bottom line, so to speak. And one of the key performance indicators that we look at is price. And so I'm, uh, I'm happy to share with you uh, some of the, the considerations that we, we utilize and uh, kind of walk you through the process and give you some examples on how to, uh, to use this uh, key performance indicator uh, in your practices. Okay, there's the disclosures. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so <clears throat> price, price, let's give it a definition. Price is the amount of money that is expected in return for a product or service, okay? And it goes both ways. You can either pay the money out or you can receive the money. And we're gonna look at it in, in both ways here in just a minute. Now, in a business, we want to quantify the price that you receive and as a function of the products and services that are sold, okay? So uh, if you'll go ahead and keep advancing that, uh, Steph, please. What we're looking at here is a graph. So this is an economics graph and I'm going to, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but on the Y axis, you'll see price. And on the X axis, you see quantity. And then what you'll see is a, a, a white bar and next to it, it says marginal cost. So marginal costs are your expenses. This is the price that you're paying in order to operate your practice. It could be rent, could be utilities, could be cost of goods, which are hearing aids, those kinds of things. And then what you'll see above the marginal cost is a, is a, uh, a triangle uh, in white, and that essentially is your profit, okay? And what we're interested in 
is looking at the difference between what you receive in a practice versus what you pay out, which results in the profit, okay? So Stephanie, if you'll advance the next slide, please. There we go. Okay. So now I'm showing you a cartoon. And the reason that I'm showing you this cartoon is for this simple fact. Price is just a number. There is a value that is associated with price. And you can, you can see that here in this cartoon. So you'll see that there's an airline here. And you'll see that there's a jet bridge and there's an individual that is trying to get on the plane. And uh, the gentleman that is sitting in the baggage car at the bottom there says for a small fee, we'll extend it all the way to the door. So this gentleman who is on the jet bridge is going to pay a price to the airline company in order to get on the plane. Now, how much money do you think this person is willing to give or the, what's the value of the, of, of the money he's willing to give given the situation that he's in now, okay? So let's look at this as a function of the next graph. Okay, Steph, if you'll push it one more time, please. Okay. So in the, la in the cartoon that I just showed you, it's not, it's not exactly the most positive uh, setting, right? The individual's got to pay some extra monies in order to get on the plane. We can actually see the profit from the pricing that occurs in this graph. So you've got a checkered area here in black that is uh, lined up against a green diagonal. The green diagonal represents the practice within the profit scope of the market. So the market has an infinite number of monies that you can make, and within that marketplace, you can only make so, you're only making so much as a, as a business. In this case, we're highlighting this as a function of the black. Well, if you look, you'll see now that there's all that white shaded area. That white shaded area is profit that is is not going into the hands of the business. Well, in the case of this airline, why do you think that that is? It's because the value that's associated with their services that they provide is not very good. So the airline is certainly going to make some money because it, it provides a, a product, but they're not maximizing their profitability. So Steph, if you'll advance to the next slide, please. And if you'll click that, I think twice. So this highlighted area here is the money that's being left on the table. It's called the, the consumer uh, surplus in, in the economics world. And these are the monies that we want to be able to capture as a business so that one, we're being efficient and number two, we're being profitable, okay? And what I mean by efficiency is, is you have so many opportunities, there's so many people that walk into your door, and the question is, is how often do they purchase from you, okay? So if you're in an audiology practice, and this could be for services, or this could be for products, or this could be for anything else, if you're seeing 100 patients a day, and you're only uh, receiving reimbursement or funds from 50% of them, you're leaving 50% of the profits on the table, so to speak. So we're looking for efficiencies, uh, and then we're also looking for profitability. Okay. So Steph, if you'll go to the next slide, please. So what we wanna do is with this framework in mind, so we've got pricing, we've got profit, and then we have this area of value. We wanna take these three pieces and we wanna look at them as a function of how we price or we think about pricing in our practices, okay? Now, when I talk about this pricing, we're talking about it, uh, if you will, in a market that is a self-payer or essentially a cash only. We're not talking about these, these payments or this pricing, if you will, uh, with respect to third-party payers. That's a whole different conversation. So we need to keep those two separate. 
Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the first step when you're thinking about pricing is you need to think about your objectives and your strategies. And if we look at the top in the green there, there are four pricing uh, objectives that are available. The first is profit oriented. The second is competition oriented. The third is uh, consumer oriented. And the fourth is sales oriented, okay? Now, the, the, the two on the outside, so the profit oriented and the sales oriented uh, have to do essentially with the practice either making more money or having more opportunities. The two in the middle, one has to do with competition and the other one has to do with the consumer or the individuals who's paying for the services and the products that you're providing, okay? So profit, profit oriented has to do with profit Competition has to do with the competitors. Consumer has to do with the individual. And sales has to do with increasing opportunities, if I haven't already said that. So now, if we look at the strategies at the bottom as they relate to the different objectives, um, and if we look at the profit-oriented, the strategy that's most used in our world, in the healthcare world, is something called the cost-plus pricing. Okay? There's a target return pricing and a price skimming but given that we only have an hour, I won't get into those this evening. If you're interested in those topics, I have another set of slides that I'm happy to share with you so that you certainly have that information. Uh, if you'll click one more time, uh, please. Okay, so under the consumer oriented, the second uh, type of pricing that we typically see in hearing healthcare is something called value-based value pricing. So if we look at both of these, they're on the opposite ends of the spectrum. The profit oriented is designed for the practice itself and the consumer oriented has to do with providing the value to the consumer. And because of the values that are provided, the consumer is willing to do this, okay? So um, although the practice is making money on both sides, one is a little more unilateral than the other one, okay? So cost plus is a little more unilateral than the consumer oriented side. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about cost plus pricing. The definition is there at the top and it's basically taking a the price, the wholesale price that uh, you paid as a business owner for a product or service and then adding some sort of a markup to that product on a, on a unit basis. Okay, so to give you an example, uh, to give you an example, let's assume that I decided to purchase a pencil and the pencil costs me a dollar and 50 cents directly from the manufacturer. So that's my wholesale cost. Now I need to turn around and make a profit on this. And in the cost plus pricing, I'm going to take that dollar and 50 cent invoice that I received per pencil and I'm going to multiply it times some coefficient. That's my markup. Most, in most places, that coefficient is a two. So they're gonna basically double the price uh, from a wholesale cost of 150 to $3. And that's how cost plus pricing works. Next slide, please. Now, value-based pricing is a little bit different. Now, if we look at the graph here, we look at the graph, and I waited to, to have both of these here so I could show you the difference. The value-based pricing is going to be a little bit higher, and you can actually see that, uh, whereas in the middle where you have price in the green box, uh, it's a little bit higher on the right-hand side under value-based pricing than it is on the left-hand side. Uh, but you'll also notice that the brand image is also larger based on the perception and the profit margin is also larger on the value based because you're emitting a different kind of a psychological uh, persona, if you will, with the services and the products that you provide. So I can give you an example of this. Let's assume that we decide that, uh, and I'm from Texas, so we're gonna talk about steaks here. So let's assume that we decide that we're gonna go have dinner and we're going to, to go out to a steak place tonight. If we went to a restaurant that was cost plus, 
uh, we may walk in, we may see the server maybe once or twice. Uh, let's say the steak is a, is a $10 plate, um, and we know roughly that it costs them $5 wholesale. Uh, at the end of the day, we pay them a $10 plus a tip, and we walk out of the place. Now, what's the value add in the cost plus pricing model? Well, from a uh, interaction uh, perspective, I really didn't have much of an interaction. My service was okay, the atmosphere was okay, and essentially I'm paying for the product and solely the product itself. Now, same steak, I now go to a different restaurant, and this restaurant is subscribing to a value-based pricing um, uh, uh, strategy. And inside this strategy, it's all about making sure that the customer's journey is one that is exceptional. And examples that I can give you of businesses that offer an exceptional service, think of Disney. If you go to Disneyland or Disney World, you are gonna pay about $200 just to enter the gate. But once you get in there, you're a king or a queen or a prince or a princess and all of the staff and everybody that's there is there to make that experience that much more joyful. If you fly on United Arab Emirates airplane, okay, it's probably the world's best customer service. They will treat you like a, a king on that plane where they give you a robe, you get slippers, uh, there's all, they're always refilling your, your drink, uh, you always have a snack or a meal, and they make sure that you're comfortable throughout your journey as you go from point A to point B. And the third example that I'll give you is if you go to the Ritz-Carlton. The Ritz-Carlton is not any hotel. As you walk into the hotel, they know your name. You are escorted from point A to point B. Um, if you are at the pool, you always have a drink. Uh, you always have a fresh towel. Um, there's always there somebody freshening up uh, your space. Uh, it's just one of these places where the customer journey is exceptional. So we're now at this restaurant and we're looking for this exceptional service. We walk in, they greet us, they share their name, everybody's friendly. Uh, they come back several times to refill our drinks. Uh, then we never have to ask for anything. And if we do, uh, it comes back in a very, very quick manner as we're leaving. The owner holds the door open, uh, both to the restaurant and to your vehicle. Now, for that experience, people are willing to pay more, and that's the value-based pricing. You're not only paying for the, for the product, but you're also paying for the added services that come with it, okay? So that's the difference between the two, and I hope I've, I hope I've made that clear. So we're gonna come back to this in just a minute. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the next step, so now that we have an idea about what our objective and our strategy is, we need to start looking at something called the demand function. Now, in order to calculate the demand function, you have to have data. It can either, it can either be data that's existing in your database, or it can be data that is nationally known that you can use at least initially as you start out your practice. And, and those data sets do exist. Now, what we're interested in finding out here is how sensitive is the market, okay? So in other words, as I change my price, the sensitivity is measured in the quantity that people purchase, okay? So let me give you an example. So on the left-hand side there, we have a graph. And on the graph are a bunch of dots with a dashed line in the middle. And on the y-axis, we have price. And on the x-axis, we have quantity, okay? Now, if I have a high price, which will be at the top of the y-axis, you'll notice that my quantity sold is going to be pretty little. I'm not gonna sell a whole lot at a very high price. So an example of a high priced, low quantity uh, um, uh, business are exotic cars. Uh, Lamborghini, Lamborghini only sold several hundred models last year because the average vehicle cost upwards of 200 or 300,000 US dollars. 
Another example um, is uh, Maserati, okay? Maserati sold a couple thousand, but their price point is very, very high. Now, on the flip side of this, if I lower my price, I'm expecting a greater increase in the quantity demanded. So since we're talking about cars, an example might be the Toyota Corolla. The Toyota Corolla is a economical vehicle, great gas mileage. It's in many people's price point. The idea here is, is we're going to make a lot of these because the price point is so low, we're going to be able to sell a ton of these. Last year, if you look up the data, they sold several hundred thousand uh, Toyota uh, Corollas. Now, what we want to do now is using these examples, we want to be able to, to measure or quantify the sensitivity in the market. So what we do is we take these dots, and there's two ways to do it. This is one way. We take the dots that you see there on the graph, and then what we do is we run a nonlinear regression through the data points, and it gives us a value, okay? That value is what we call our demand function. The demand function is going to be a negative number because this is a negative downward sloping uh, 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 slope function, and when the value, now I'm looking at the box here, when the value here is larger than one, okay, the absolute value of one, so we're dropping the negative sign, if it's 1.6, 3.0, 5.0, it basically means that this market overall is price sensitive. And what that means is, is if I increase my prices, I'm going to lose a large share of quantity demanded. If I reduce my prices, I'm going to gain a large number of individuals in my market, okay? On the flip side, if the demand function is less than the absolute value of one and I increase my prices, my depreciation in quantity demanded is actually going to be very small because people are not as price sensitive. And if I decrease my prices, I'm not going to gain a whole lot of individuals into the marketplace. I'm going to gain a few, okay? The hearing aid market as a whole has an inelastic demand. People are not price sensitive. That does not mean that price is not an important factor or a decision when they're deciding on whether or not to adopt amplification. There are lots of factors into that. What it essentially means is, is if, we, if you were out go out to go out and market and reduce a hearing aid, say from $1,500 retail to $1,200 retail, don't expect a large line at the door because it's not going to happen in this market. That's essentially what we're talking about here. Next slide, please. Okay. The other way to measure the demand function is this thing called arc of elasticity. And for those of you that are in clinical practices or you're seeing patients, this is the model that's probably going to uh, be of most interest to you. What this model is, is essentially, we've taken the same uh, axes, right? Price on the Y and quantity demanded on the X. And instead of looking at the entire nonlinear line, we are looking at various points on that line, and we're looking to see at which point we go from being price sensitive to price insensitive. So to give you an example, if you look at P1 and Q1, it tells me my initial price. I now want to compare the pricing for P1, Q1 to P2, Q2. And I want to see whether or not there's a change in the sensitivity between those two price points. Now, at the same time, I also want to do this one more time between P2, Q2, and P3, Q3, so that I can see whether there's a change in the price sensitivity between those points. And by doing that, it will allow me to make the right adjustments when I have smaller intervals of retail pricing within the entire scope of my practice. So let me show you this on the next slide, please. 
Okay, so what I have here is I'm actually showing you. All right, so we're looking at this practice, and what we do, what we want to look at is this arc of elast uh, arc of elasticity. So we have a hypothetical practice here. We have fiscal data. Uh, let's say this goes from October 2018 to 2019. So we're looking at last year's data because we're now in 2019-2020. Okay. What you'll see on the left-hand side is a Q, and that's the quantity of units. And I'm using hearing aids here because it's the easiest thing to measure. We've got the quantity of hearing aids on the left-hand side for the different technology levels that we dispense in ABC Audiology's practice. You'll then see uh, two columns over a P, and the P is the retail price of those devices. And then on the far right, you will actually see an R, and the R is the revenue and the way that we calculate the revenue for each row is we multiply the Q or the quantity times the P. So on the first row, we have a 20, which is the quantity. When we multiply that times a, a thousand, uh, which is a thousand dollars per unit uh, for the price, which gives us a revenue for that line of $20,000. And as we do that for each of the lines, we can tally it up. And at the end, we have now uh, 75 uh, devices that we dispensed last year, which grossed us $176,200 uh, in, in, uh, in gross profit. Now, what we want to do is we want to be able to look at this data and potentially make changes. Okay, So you'll see there's formulas there at the bottom where it says e uh, equation one, uh, we have the elasticity equals, and then in the numerator, we have the percentage change of QX over the percentage change of PX. And that's what we're trying to find. That's the elasticity. That's the fifth column. The way that we do this is by using uh, equation two for quantity and equation three for price. So to give you an example, if we take uh, the quantity in the second row of 17 and we subtract 17 from 20, I will then have my numerator, which is minus three. And then what I want to do is I want to find my denominator on the bottom. And in order to do this, I'm going to take the same 17 on row two, and I'm going to add it to the um, uh, value uh, on the first row of 20. I'm going to add them together, and I'm going to divide by two to get the average. So now I have minus three divided by uh, 37 divided by two is 18 and a half. And when I make this division, I get a value of minus 0 0.1666. Uh, I didn't round up here, but you'll see the value is minus 0 0.16. I do the same thing for each of the other rows. So my next arc elasticity would be 14 minus 17. My third one would be 11 minus 14 and so forth and so on, okay? I'm going to do the same thing with my price because I want to pick, I want to determine the change or the delta in my pricing. So I'm going to go back up to the row where the quantity is 17. My pricing is $1,700 for that line, and I'm going to subtract it from 1,000. So in my numerator, I get 700, and 700... Uh, that's then divided by the average of uh, 2,700, so it's 1,000 plus 1,700, will give me 1,350. And when I make that division, I get a value of positive 0.52. And so now what I want to do is I want to take the change in uh, the percentage change in quantity demanded, so the second column, and the percentage change in price, which is the fourth column, and come up with the elasticity in that bin. So minus 0 0.16 divided by 0 0.52 gives me an elasticity function of um, negative 0 0.31. That there is less than the absolute value of one, which tells me that at that low price point, my consumers, my patients that are coming in are price insensitive. So if I reduce the price or I increase the price, I'm neither going to gain nor really lose anybody. But now let's go to where the price is $4,000.
and the elasticity function is now minus 1.65. So at this higher end uh, uh, price point, you'll notice that if I drop the negative number, I have an absolute value of 1.65, and that value is greater than one, which means folks are price sensitive here. So if I reduce this price, I'm going to gain more individuals. And if I increase this price, I'm going to lose a fair amount of individuals. So as you're working in your practice and you're able to make these, these uh, uh, calculations, it will then help you as you start to decide on what the pricing points are going to be. And you'll make these measurements usually on a annual basis and if you're new to the practice or you're making lots of significant changes to your practice, you might make them in more uh, stricter intervals, maybe in a quarterly or in a, um, a semi-annually basis. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Oh, yeah. Okay, so now what I wanna show you is the fact that these changes actually impact these price sensitivity changes or values actually impact your revenue, your total revenue. So if I have an elastic demand, a value that's greater than the absolute value of one, and I raise my prices, as I said earlier, my total revenue is going to decrease because I'm going to lose a fair number of individuals. So to give you an example, if I have a $4,000 product and all of a sudden I decide to uh, charge $4,500, instead of having 10 individuals purchase it, I might now have five. Because of that uh, difference, I've now lost uh, $40,000 minus $22,500. I've lost $17,500. Okay. Now, on the elastic demand, if I decide to reduce prices, I'm actually going to gain an increase in my total revenue. So going back to this $4,000 unit uh, price, if I now reduce it to, let's say, $3,500, instead of having 10 individuals, I might now have 15. So instead of a $40,000 uh, revenue stream, I now have a $60,000 plus revenue stream. Okay, do you see how this is working? It's, 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 kind, of, it's kind of cool. If we now go to an inelastic demand, it's the opposite effect. Here, if we have an inelastic demand and we raise prices, our total revenue increases. So what that means is, is that my lower end products, right, which is where we had the minus 0.3 value, let's say it was $1,500 and I was selling 20 of these. If I decide to raise my price, I'm not going to lose, I'm not going to lose a whole lot of folks. Instead of having 20, I might have 19 or 18. But with the shift in the price, I've now made up that difference. Okay. In the inelastic demand, if I decide to reduce my price, I'm now actually reducing my total revenue stream. So in the audiology world, if you have an economy line device and you decide to discount it, you may have the same number of individuals that are purchasing it, but because the quantity demanded has an increase, you're actually losing money in your practice, okay? So that's where this is a very, very critical analysis, and it's something to think about from the beginning so you know what the market looks like, but also to measure this later on. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. Next slide, please. Okay, and if you'll click it one more time, please. So what this is showing you on the left-hand side uh, mm -hmm. from 2015, this is a little bit dated. I'm actually working on this now uh, to, to update it. Uh, what you're looking on the left-hand side here is the wholesale hearing aid average sale price. At the bottom in the blue uh, uh, squares there is the economy line. In the middle circles there, we're looking at the uh, midline and on colorblind, I think that's orange or red uh, triangles at the top there. That is your premium line, okay? And so if you look at the wholesale prices, you'll notice that at low prices, the curve goes up. The reason being, it's price insensitive. 
And at the very top where the premium devices are, it's price insensitive, prices are going down. If you look on the right hand side, those are the retail prices, you will actually see the same effect. Okay, You'll, except for the premium line has stayed constant. The reason being, that's where practices make the majority of their money. Okay, So this is just to show you that this is not only going to work in your practice, this is what the manufacturers are also using uh, when, they're, uh, when they're selling you the hearing aids and making recommendations on manufacturer suggested uh, retail prices. Next slide, please. Okay, step three. And what we need to determine next is the type of pricing transparency. And I used this graph uh, just to show you what the differences were between the models. So um, we have hearing aids and we have the various features and most people do not uh, unbundle, if you will, or itemize their devices. Um, uh, but I, again, I just wanna show you the models here. If we look uh, where it says pure price bundling, what that essentially means there on the, uh, in the, le on the second column is that pricing model is going to be cumulative. The patient or the consumer is only going to see one price. Everything that is uh, embedded underneath that price, uh, they will not be able to see its mask, if you will. And we do this with hearing aids. We'll, you know, we'll see a patient and say, Mr. Smith, you've just purchased these, these midline hearing aids. Uh, the cost of each device was $2,000 per unit. Uh, we're gonna bundle these together. It's now $4,000 uh, and that's the bundled model, right? Where they really know that they're getting a device, but the services may not be clear because we really haven't shared that information with them. We're now gonna look at the far right column where it says price unbundling. And you'll notice here that there's a breakdown or there's a, a, a cost associated with every feature of the hearing aid, starting with the hearing aid itself, going all the way down from three memories down to the manufacturer's warranty. You'll notice at the end, the total price of the device is exactly the same. The difference here is, is I am now itemizing or I am showcasing to the patient or the consumer a price uh, a price that's associated with each of the various products and services that they're purchasing. So the question becomes, for your practice, are you wanting to bundle or are you wanting to itemize? Just as a frame of reference, on the far right-hand side there, there is a screenshot of a, um, a form there that is typically used in a, ch a charge form that's typically used in the clinic. And if you'll notice, when we provide services or diagnostic services, we actually itemize. So we're circling each thing that we did in order to get reimbursed. We don't necessarily do that for hearing aids and when we're working in a self-pay market. Okay. So this is just to give you some, frame, uh, some framework here. Next slide, please. Okay, so the fourth step now is we want to determine our expenses. We'll do that first. And then the next step is to determine our annual contact hours and that you need data for this, okay? So your expenses, most practices have two types of expenses. They have fixed costs. So fixed costs are typically things like the rent that you pay. It's typically X number of dollars every month. Uh, another fixed cost may be if you have salaried employees, their salary is exactly the same every month. Uh, so those are a couple of examples, but you may also have variable costs and most of your variable costs are going to be operational. So for example, your utilities, your utilities are not always going to be the same number. They're going to vary from season to season and uh, throughout the year. Uh, you, you may have, uh, if you give out commissions, those are going to be variable. Uh, so those are things that are variable. And what we want to do is we want to figure out what all of our fixed costs are what all of our variable costs are so that we can figure out what our total costs are. What is it costing us to operate that clinic? Okay, so that's the first thing. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next thing that we want to calculate is we want to calculate annual contact hours. So these are the hours that your staff 
and yourself are working in a clinic. So what I did here was I took the liberty of saying we have uh, two full-time providers who work an average of 35 hours a week in which they have uh, contact hours with patients and that they're working an average of 48 weeks out of the year. So they've got four weeks of vacation. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and so what we want to do now is with this data, now that we've collected the expense side and our costs for uh, our, our service, we now want to calculate the break-even point. The break-even point is the dollar value that you need to generate on an hourly basis in order to keep your doors open, okay? Now, I want to preface that by saying it, the, the calculations are a little bit different if you subscribe to the bundled model versus the unbundled model. And that's what I'm going to show you next. So next slide, please. Okay, so I have previous year's data. So fiscal year 2018, 2019, my formula is there at the top. And you'll notice I took the liberty of telling you that the total annual expenses for this practice, this ABC practice, was 600000 And I had that from personnel expenses, so salaries and benefits. I had that from clinic expenses, which was rent, utilities, and office supplies. And then I also included my cost of goods sold, which is the wholesale cost that I'm paying for hearing aids and assistive listening devices. Okay. Now, my annual contact hours are come from the data that I showed you earlier, where we are working 35 hours a week for 48 weeks, and there's two providers. If I multiply 35 times 48 times 2, I get 3,360. So when I divide 600,000 by 3,360, I come up with a bundled hourly rate of 100 and essentially $79. That's the money that I need to generate on an annual, I'm sorry, on an hourly basis in order to keep my doors open. Okay. Let's go to the next slide, please. What's cool about this calculation is you can start to plan for the future. Okay. So here's an example. So now you'll notice it's highlighted. We're now looking at the 2019-2020 uh, uh, fiscal year. And in bold at the bottom here, you'll notice that my personnel and clinic expenses increased by 20,000 and my cost of goods were going to increase by 10,000. Okay. So in the middle line there, instead of 600,000 where total annual expenses are, it's now 630, but I'm still working the same number of hours for the, between these two providers. So now my hourly rate in order to keep the doors open, my break-even rate, went from $179 to $188. So it's a $9 an hour difference that I now need to make up between last year's clinic and this year's clinic. Next slide, please. Okay, now here what I'm showing you is the itemized or unbundled hourly rate. Okay, and it's different, okay? So the only difference here is in the itemized uh, uh, calculation, I'm not including the cost of goods. I'm not including the wholesale cost of my hearing aids and my assistive listening devices in the calculation. So you'll notice here that my total annual expenses are less. They're 300,000. The hours that I worked stay the same, and my hourly rate is now $89.29. This is based primarily on services and services alone. Next slide, please. And if I were to now have a personnel increase of $20,000, which I shared with you last time, yeah. I'm now, uh, my total annual expenses have increased from $300,000 to $320,000. I'm still dividing by the, the, the same annual contact hours, and my hourly rate went up by roughly $6 or so, for about $95, okay? So it's allowing me to see what I need to provide from a service standpoint and what I need to provide from a bundle standpoint. And if you subtract the two, quite frankly, you'll see what the product difference is as well, okay? So 
looking at the data in this way allows you to have a pulse of how your clinic is functioning, which is very, very critical. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're able to calculate the break-even point, and by doing that, we now, again, have a pulse on where we are with the clinic. We know what our expenses are. We know where our profit is. And then we can start to think about what we want to do. Do we want to increase the profitability? Is there things that we can do to potentially decrease our costs? So, for example, uh, if you have a janitorial service and it's costing you $5,000 a year, could you now eliminate the janitorial service and take care of uh, cleaning up your office before you leave? that then would allow for more profitability in your practice. So those are the kinds of things that you need to start thinking about. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, step six. Step six, as you'll see from this cartoon here, is the reality of most healthcare professionals, including audiologists. What happens is, is we get so busy with the clinic and meeting the needs of our patients that we do all these things to figure out what we have to do in order to keep the doors open. But then when it comes time to start looking at the financials and being proactive about where things are good and bad, we don't spend a lot of time making the right measurements and then uh, we get ourselves into some trouble, okay? And so what I really want to emphasize to you all today as, as budding audiologists and potentially private practice owners, as you start to build out what you're going to do with the practice, don't forget to analyze and realize what your profitability is so that you can see how the business is run. Okay? And so I'm going to give you a couple of tools here to look at uh, that will hopefully uh, give you some uh, ways to to uh, assess uh, the health, if you will, of your practice. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the first thing that you have to think about is what type of accounting method you're going to use. And this is critical uh, because it will then uh, lend to whether or not you do certain processes. So let me let me explain this. Uh, there's two types of accounting. At the very top, there's an accrual basis uh, accounting style. And at the bottom, there's one that's called a cash basis. Okay, uh, So I'm going to start at the bottom where it says cash basis because I see a lot of this. Uh, the cash basis is essentially this. So in this practice, what has happened is I made a transaction on May the 20th. Okay, uh, You decided that you were going to uh, fit me with some devices, and I uh, gave you the money for those devices. Uh, sorry, I didn't give you the money for those devices. I took those devices on a trial period, okay? So it's on May 20th that I took those, and let's say that June 5th I decided to come back and to pay for these devices. And let's assume, just for our argument's sake, that it was $1,000. You're not recording that transaction until the money is received. The issue with this is the product has already gone out, so it's left your inventory. You are still responsible for paying it back. How do you know from a financial sense that these monies are owed and you have an accounts receivable that's due to you because you're not accounting for it in your books? In the accrual basis, that's what this allows for. It allows you to say that on May, on May the 20th, I took this device and I'm expecting to receive $1,000 for it. I didn't get it today, but I'm gonna get it at some point. And then on June the 5th, I can go in and say, I had this uh, accounts receivable, this person has now paid it, so he owed it, he paid it, those two things cross out, and I now don't have to worry about not knowing that the inventory has left my building and that I'm still responsible for it, okay? So one of the things that I implore you to consider as you become practice owners is get with an accountant or take some accounting classes and ensure that you're making the right recordings so that, again, you know what's happening with the inventory in your practices 
not only with the products, but with the services that you're delivering. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the, the balance sheet that I'm showing you here is one of three um, uh, statements that's part of something called your financial statement, okay? And what we're looking at here on the balance sheet is a snapshot of what your company owns, which is your assets, and what it owes, which is your liabilities. And as you look at this data on the left-hand column, you'll notice that your assets in this example equal $101,000 even, and you'll notice that your liabilities equal $101,000 even. So what that means is, is what you owe and what you own balance each other out. So again, this is one way of looking at your data. Next slide, please. The second document that's part of your financial statement, your overall financial statement, is this thing called the income statement. This is also called your profit and loss statement. Um, so what we have here is for the period ending December 31st, we have an income of $94,600 for services that we render. You'll now notice at the bottom there, we tally up all of our expenses and in parentheses, there's $75,366. If I subtract the income from the expenses and I get a positive number, it means that I have a profit. And in this case, $15,820. If my expenses were larger than my income, I would then have a loss, which means my company is not doing well, okay? This is the one that most people look at, but you need to look at the, both the balance sheet and this profit and loss sheet as well. Next slide, please. Okay, and then this next one here is your cash flow statement, okay? Uh, so the balance sheet, the income statement, and this cash flow sheet are your financial statements that you must have for every practice. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to look at the trends in your business, okay? So for example, you'll notice at the top, it goes from 2012, and it looks like it goes out to 2019 or 2020, my views obscured here. Um, and it, well, if we look at net earnings, you can actually see the trend in 2012 is two thousand dollars, well, twenty five hundred bucks, and as we go to two thousand and sixteen, so from thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, my earnings are starting to go up and up, which means the trajectory is good, and they continue to move in that direction. Okay, I can also look at, for example, um, my operations to see whether or not they're trending up or they're trending down. So this cash flow looks at the trends in your practice and it will uh, give you some insight as to where you might have some hiccups. And those hiccups may have occurred because a provider left. Uh, they may have um, uh, occurred because of a health issue and those kinds of things. So again, this is another really important uh, financial uh, uh, file that you need. Uh, next slide, please. We're almost done. Uh, I know we're running out of time. So a couple of more uh, KPIs or, or uh, performance uh, indicators uh, that I'm going to share with you here that allow you to dive a little bit deeper into the weeds. So the three that I just showed you are mandatory. These other ones here are not necessarily mandatory. They're up to you, okay? So here what we're looking at is what we call your current ratio. And what we wanna look at here is your, uh, the number of times that your assets cover your liabilities. So what we've done is we've taken the assets in the yellow there from 1997, and we've taken the liabilities from 1997, and we've divided the assets by the liabilities in order to get a value. We did the same thing in 1998 and in 1999. And you'll notice that from 97 to 98 to 99, I'm getting an increase in my ratio what that there means is, is my assets are greater than my liabilities, which then tells me that my practice is more profitable. Okay, so that's a measure that you can use at your discretion. Next slide, please. 
For the accounts receivable turnover, what we're looking at here is the how quickly you're getting paid for items that are outstanding. Things that are typically outstanding or take time to process are insurance and credit cards, okay? And so what's happening here is we are looking at uh, the values in the accounts receivable bin between two points. So we got 20X1 and 20X0. And if we look under 20X1 under average receivables, we have 18,567 plus 19,230. And we take the average of that and we get uh, basically 18,900. We then take our credit sales and divide it by this average. And it tells us, a, it gives us a value of 6.8. We do the same thing in the middle column and in the right column to look at those values. And what we're starting to see is as we move from the left to the right, we're moving from 6.8 times to 5.3 times. The smaller the number means that I'm getting my monies quicker, okay? So if you've got different payers, this is a nice way to look at their trends to see how quickly you're getting paid because it's gonna back up on your accounts receivable. Okay, next slide, please. Basically, this slide here is looking at assets, uh, uh, converting your assets into cash. So we're liquidating the practice for whatever reason. Uh, essentially, we're doing the same kind of thing that we did in the, in the previous ratio. We're taking the values that are the um, total assets in X1. We're adding them to X0. We're taking the average of those two uh, and coming up with a value and then dividing the average total assets. Sorry, taking the net sales and dividing it by the average total assets. And what we're finding here is that the higher the ratio, it means the more liquid our um, business is. Next slide, please. Okay. What we're looking at here now is gross profit. So this is before expenses. And what we wanna know is what's the percentage of our gross profit? In order to calculate this, what we're doing is we're taking the gross profit and dividing it by our sales. So in this example, uh, we have a gross profit of $40,000, and we're now dividing that by our revenue, and it's telling us that our gross profit margin is 40%. In option two, we make the same calculation and the, you'll notice that the, um, the gross profit is, is higher. Uh, it's up to 50,000, which now means we've got a 50% gross margin. The higher your gross margin, the more money you're actually making in your practice. Okay. Next slide, please. This is the same calculation, but now we're looking at it from the gross minus the expenses. So we're looking at net profit. This is the actual monies that you're putting in your pocket, so to speak. And so to calculate this, we're looking at the net profit divided by the revenue. In the left-hand column, it's 15%. And in the right column, it's 25%. The reason being is that we uh, reduced our cost of goods. Okay. Next slide, please. And then the last thing that I, I uh, implore you to look at are ratios. And these ratios have to do with your gross margin, your operating margin, and your profit margin. And so the, the data is on the left-hand column. The calculations are on the right-hand side. And as you look at your gross margin, we're essentially taking the gross profit of 10940 dividing it by our net sales of 32983 which tells me that my gross profit before expenses is 33.2%. Uh, my operating profit, okay, is uh, 3,130 divided by my net sales of 32,983. It's costing me roughly 10% to operate my business. And then the a net profit uh, is roughly 2,200, uh, sorry, 2,126 divided by 32,983, which is my net sales, and my profit margin is 6.4. So if you didn't want to look at it as a function of dollars, you would look at it as a function of percentages. We do this here at Autogy 
because we group practices together and we don't want to look at dollar amounts because each practice is a little bit different, but we can then standardize and compare practices uh, across each other by looking at percentages. And so that's when these come in really, really handy. Last slide, I promise. So let's put all of this together so you get a sense of how this might work, okay? Uh, so this is something that I'm working on internally for, for Audigy, and I thought I would share this with you because I think it's pretty cool. What you have on the left-hand side are three pricing models. You have your cost plus. You've got your cost plus that has now a reduced co uh, cost of goods. And then at the bottom, a value-based model. Now. In this model, every, it's, again, it's private pay, so self-pay. We're seeing 100 patients uh, in every one of these instances, and each patient is being seen for one hour. Just makes the math easier. Now, the revenue from P your, the diagnostics for your patients uh, is $1. So our patient services revenue is $100, which is the fourth column. And it's the same for all of the models. Now, my conversion rate, so we're talking about hearing aids in this case, is 30%. I'm bundling my price, and because I'm bundling my price, uh, what you're seeing here is a conversion rate of 30. So I dispense 30 devices out of the 100 people that I saw. At $10 per unit, that's 300, plus the 100 that I received for the services that are provided. So my gross revenue for my cost plus models for both of them is $400. Okay, I'm going to come back to the value based in a minute. If I now start to look at my total expenses, my hourly rate is my break even rate, which we calculated earlier in this session. It's $2. My cost of goods is $2.50. So my hourly rate is $2. I saw 100 patients, so it's costing me $200 to operate my practice. And my cost of goods is $75 because I dispensed 30 devices at $2.50. So 200 plus 75 gives me my total expenses of 275 for the cost plus. My COGS or my cost of goods is lower because I've negotiated a lower price in the middle column for cost plus uh, reduced goods and it's now $245, okay? And my net revenue for the cost plus is 125 and my reduced, uh, my cost plus for the reduced goods is 155. So that's the profit that I'm making. Let's look at the value-based. In the value-based model, again, my services are the same. My conversion rate is going to be higher. And the reason it's higher is I'm providing an exemplary service. Because I'm providing an exemplary service, it's going to affect the way in which the consumer with whom I interacted feels about how I'm providing services and the likelihood of acquisition or adoption goes up, okay? So in this case, we made it 40%. But you'll also notice I'm charging a higher fee. I'm providing more services, it's costing me more, and therefore I'm charging more, okay? So it's now $12.50. So I get $100 for my service revenue, I'm now getting $500 for my hearing aid revenue, which gives me a gross revenue of 600. For my hourly rate, it's the same. For my cost of goods, it's going to be higher because I've now, uh, for lack, again, this is for Audigy, so take this with a grain of salt. I've now partnered with a business solutions company that's helping me with the finances and the marketing and what have you. So I'm paying a little bit more for my cost of goods which is now increasing my total expenses to 320. And I get that from the $200 from the patients that I saw and from the $120, the 40 times the $3 uh, the equals 120, add that to the 200, I get $320 in expenses. But you'll notice my net revenue is much higher, okay? So I'm making more money. Here's the other cool thing that you can do and it's the very last column. And that is I can take my net revenue and I can divide it by my gross revenue and it gives me my conversion rate, my conversion costs. So for the cost plus, $125 in net revenue divided by my gross revenue, 
is giving me a value of 0.69. If I go to my uh, cost plus uh, with the reduced goods, I'm getting a value of 0.61, and in my value-based, I'm getting a value of 0.53. So the value-based in this example is actually making me more profitable, and I'm actually working not as hard because I'm converting more people, and because I'm converting more people, my expenses are going down. So these are the kinds of things that you can use to actually get a pulse on how your practice is going. And you can do this over time, which will then allow you to see how your practice is growing. And from that, you can start to make decisions or educated decisions on whether you need to bring in another provider, you need to open another location, or maybe you need to let somebody go. Okay? And with that, I thank you for your time. I'm happy to entertain any questions that you may have, either now or later. You have my email address. And again, thank you so much for the invitation. I hope this was helpful for you all. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Amlani. That was an incredibly informative presentation. And we do have a few questions for you. Um, the first is, uh, as the life cycle of a product or service evolves, does the pricing strategy also change? So you may start perhaps with a skimming strategy and then maybe move to value-based at some point, or does it stay the same over time? So that's a good question. Um, so what we're finding historically is once people get into a strategy, they stay in that strategy, okay? Uh, and I think part of that has to do with a, a certain comfort level and because they're, it, hearing aid practices for the most part, historically, uh, we'll, we'll have to see what it is in the future, but historically have been very, very profitable. Now, uh, to answer your question, uh, what most people have done is that. That's not to say that you couldn't start somewhere and eventually evolve. The question that, um, the question that I would ask you rhetorically is, uh, at what point would you be able to change and um, how would you know when to change? Because in this kind of a dynamic, it usually takes you anywhere between six to nine months of data in order to make a decision. So I've, I've kind of asked you, I answered your question in a very roundabout way because there's no real true answer. It's a kind of trial by fire, if you will. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful. Um, the next question sort of looks at the future and is asking, um, how will OTC hearing aids and their availability or wider availability in the market impact elasticity, if at all, for hearing aids? Yeah, so that is an absolute great question. So we didn't talk about this. So if you, the, there, there are four pieces to the law of demand. One of them, which is introducing substitute products. By introducing substitute products, more people are apt to try that technology or that product. So what's going to happen is it's going to actually make the market more sensitive, okay? So it'll still stay insensitive, but it'll move, for example, from a 0.5 to maybe a 0.6 or a 0.7. Um, and so what those devices then will do is it will actually change the manner in which we are pricing our devices and it's actually going to force us to downward push our pricing. When we do that, we're going to have to counter that by actually seeing more patients because there's less profitability in the device. And because you're making less profit, you're going to have to reduce the time that you spend with a patient and, and increase the number of patients that you see on an annual basis. So I'm working on some things internally here uh, that are actually looking at this and what we're finding is this. There are certain practices that are value-based that will continue to thrive in a value-based market. Think of the Lamborghinis and the Maseratis that we talked about earlier. You've got Ford and you've got Toyota and you've got all these Hondas and all these other things that could potentially cannibalize them, but they don't. You also have practices that might engage in reducing their prices where they have to see more patients and that's what we call race to the bottom. And so as a practice owner, you have to decide philosophically, am I going to race to the bottom? Because that's what's going to happen from a pricing standpoint, 
or am I going to stay firm and am I going to be the little boutique in my in my space? And people love to go to boutiques. There aren't as many of them, but you should be able to survive in that market. Thank you. This this question kind of appears to be a segue from that. Um, as you're as if you're uh, relatively um, let's see steady in your practice, um, but you're thinking about changing uh, some of your services or maybe moving from a bundled to an unbundled model. What are some opportunities to sort of increase the perceived value of your services or how would you potentially test different types and level of services that could be viewed as having a higher value if you're trying to do value-based pricing? So that's a great question and that is a, that's a fantastic question. So yeah, uh, how is it that you increase your value? Uh, so what we do here at Oddities when we're, we're, we're working with our, our our, uh, our members, we call them, and we're looking to switch from model A to model B, we actually do an analysis. So we do a forecasting. Uh, that's the first thing we do. So in, if by moving from this model to this model, is it even feasible before we do anything else? If the model shows that we're not going to be profitable, then there's no point in moving forward. Okay, that's very simple. If the model does show that we're profitable, the question becomes what value can we add in order to meet this forecast? And so then it's a matter of potentially just having conversations uh, with patients, um, attending uh, some of their sessions and seeing what it is that they're struggling with. So examples might be tinnitus. There's a large population that struggles with tinnitus but not everybody is providing that service. So now this leads to an opportunity to increase not only the service line, but potentially the product line if you're going to be dispensing maskers. Another way to look at it is looking at more diagnostics and potentially doing more things like balance testing, central auditory processing, and those kinds of things. But do the forecast first, make sure it's viable, and then start having conversations, start listening, put your ground your ears to the ground, figure out what's attainable, what you have a skill set in, and then move forward through uh, advertising and showcasing your skill set. And then, of course, uh, physician referrals and, and getting your name out in the, into, the, uh, into the right uh, uh, places. Thank you. Um, we do have a few more questions, and thank you, Dr. Amlani, for answering them so effectively. Um, this, these next two questions have to do with sort of determining and looking and considering your break even and some of your costs. So the first one is when you're, when you're looking at total contact hours, as you get more, I guess, adept at doing that, should you be then breaking those hours out by different service types? So should they be broken out by fitting, by diagnostic, or are they broken out by codes eventually when you're doing these calculations? The answer is no in the model that I showed you. It's just your overall time with a patient. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question is then as you, pre as you look at variable costs, can you talk a little bit about whether or not there's a way to predict those or to do some predictive analytics for those? And are there some cases where you actually want them to go up a little bit? For example, if you're paying commissions uh, to an employee and you see those variable costs go up, it would presumably mean that that, um, that audiologist is um, having a higher conversion rate. Yeah, absolutely. So with your variable cost as it relates to profitability, so in this example, the commission for an individual, if they're making more commission, you would automatically assume that you're making more profit and, but you need to go in and actually double check that. And the reason I say that is because is the profitability coming from lower end devices or is the profitability coming from higher end devices where you have a larger markup traditionally. And so uh, the degree or the amount of profitability is actually in the financial data, but you're right, the overall trend is gonna push up because the person's making more money and you'll probably have a higher conversion rate. Okay. 
that makes sense. Um, the next question, these two questions kind of also go together. So a, a lot of the folks who are with us this evening are thinking about starting a new practice, perhaps okay. for a business plan competition or just perhaps for real life. Um, is there, in that case, a way for them to find some resources so that they could predict what expenses and break even might be based on type of practice, based on data that might exist in the industry that could be available to them? That is another great question. Um, so I do know, so for example, if you are, are looking at starting a new business, uh, some of your um, uh, initial costs, so for example, the rent that you're going to pay, those kinds of things are going to be uh, localized to each individual market, right? So for example, I live in Dallas, Texas. That market is a very, very different than Chicago or New York. So to calculate that data or to capture that data, I would have to go and meet with somebody uh, in that local area. In terms of the costs for cost of goods, that is available. In terms of salaries, uh, that is available through the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. Um, so to answer your question, you'll have the, the data is available. You're going to have to go to a, a wealth of different sources in order to capture the right set of data, but it is certainly available. And then things that are more localized to your environment uh, are things that you will have to capture as you have conversation with real estate agents and potentially other uh, owners uh, that are in the area in which you're deciding to open your practice. Great. Okay, we have the last few questions here. This one's a little bit related to the last, and that is, are there tools available that will allow practices to sort of plug in their data um, that will demonstrate the formulas that you discussed this evening, both from the pricing determinant standpoint, but then also to kind of figure out your break-even costs? So I'm not aware of any calculators that are available. Uh, I'm certainly happy to work offline with this individual or a group of individuals that would like to have these calculations available in an Excel spreadsheet uh, that we can then share with other um, SADA members, uh, you know, now and in the future. Great. Thank you. Um, and then I believe this is the last question, unless something else comes into the queue. Um, how do you collect data on price changes, and is changing the cost of the hearing aids between patients uh, raising red flags with insurance companies? So I think, again, tonight you were talking about things that are just strictly private pay uh, models, but if I think this question is more about if you are getting insurance reimbursement, are there other challenges perhaps with um, changing fees and, and th those sorts of things that you don't have in this private pay scenario? Yes. Yeah. 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 So that's a good question. So with, 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 with reimbursement, you typically have a signed contract that you're going to get paid X amount for the services and potentially for the devices or depending on how the contract is written, maybe the, the company will provide the devices. But in a private pay model, uh, this, becomes, this becomes an exercise. Uh, and when I was the, the department chair, we decided to change the pricing uh, at the University of Arkansas in the med school there. And uh, what we ended up having to do was we ended up having to notify our patients uh, some period in advance. And I think we did it, I think it was five months or six months in advance, letting them know that on this date that the hearing aid prices were going to change uh, the change was coming about because of, uh, you know, uh, uh, inflation and, and, and those kinds of things. And once we shared that information and were transparent uh, with these individuals, it wasn't such a big deal. Uh, so the, the name of the game here, from my perspective, is keep your patients informed. Make sure you give them enough time. Uh, and if I remember right, we even had a focus group one night where we invited folks to come in. I think we had four or five people show up and they asked uh, questions about why we were doing these things. Uh, we gave them cookie and coffee and we set, we, un, we settled their, their nervousness by making these changes. So be proactive. Excellent advice. Thank you.
And thank you, Dr. Amlani, again. This was a great presentation. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone for attending. We are out of time for today's session, but if you have additional questions, uh, please send them to info at audiologist.org, or you can send them to aamlani at audigy.com, as you can see on the screen. We will also be glad to forward anything that we receive here to Dr. Amlani. If you have friends and colleagues that were unable to attend the webinar today, please do let them know that the session has been recorded. We will send a link out to attendees after the recording is posted, and you'll also be able to find it in about a week. Um, for more information about future SATA practice uh, management webinars and to register, please visit audiologist.org backslash students. Also, a big shout out to Kate and um, some of the students who have been working very diligently to make sure that all of the recordings are very accessible. So Kate and Kyle Lampett, I would like to thank you very much for your work on that as well. So with that, um, we will end our webinar this evening and I look forward to talking with you again very soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you.